Fletcher. Today we're privileged to hear Dr. Tim Whitehood, currently the Omar Smith Endowed Professor of Kinesiology and the Director of the City and J. Alfred Fines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance at Texas A&M University. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want to Dr. Latku is a registered clinical exercise physiology, a past president of the Southeast Regional Chapter, past member of the Board of Trustees, and a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. He received his PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Tennessee, a Master's of Education in Exercise Physiology, and a Bachelor of Science in Physical Education at Northeast Louisiana University. Dr. Latku had a three-year postdoctoral experience at the John Hopkins University. He was an assistant and associate professor at Florida Atlantic University for six years. She was a department chair and a professor at the University of North Carolina Charlotte for 14 years. And he was a chair for nine. Dr. Latham has authored over 50 scientific refereed journal articles and over 97 abstracts on the genetics of daily physical activity. He has secured 90 grants either as the principal investigator or the co-principal investigator from a variety of NIH, NSF, and other internal external sources. Today, the title of Dr. Lightfoot's lecture is, Is Voluntary Activity Really Voluntary? New Understandings in the Regulation of Activity. I have heard Dr. Lightfoot speak before, and I can assure you that you're in for an extraordinary lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Lightfoot. Thank you and good afternoon. We've had some fun times with the audio up here, as some of you have heard. So uh, if you can't hear me, especially in the back row, please, are you good back there? I'm going to look at you for, with the man with the hat back there. You're, you're my, my, there you go. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Priscilla, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. McEwen for uh, or, or organizing this visit and for the Texas ACSM for funding this. I am really pleased to be here to share with you some of our um, results and some of the thoughts that we have in this area. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, I may look like an old guy, but it wasn't that long ago where I was sitting where many of y'all are. And uh, it's uh, quite a tribute to the people that I've worked with over the years that I'm actually even standing here. Uh, it's a, uh, actually quite, uh, quite an honor to be able to add it, be added to the list of speakers that you've had in the speaker series over the years, so many of which that I've, I know personally and, and have helped me through my career. And I would encourage you all to get to know those people that you see, just the names on the, on the wall in the hall, because so many of them are so generous with their times and, and their time and will help you out. Um, I, one word before we go on, you may only know of the Huffines as a car dealership. But so I wanted to take a moment and tell you about the Huffines Institute. This is an institute at Texas A&M that the Huffines family has supported over the years. Our mission, we've really gotten cranked up over the last couple of years uh, since I've been at A&M. Our mission is to facilitate research, practice, and communication between sports science and the rest of the world. Uh, too, too often, sports scientists don't talk anymore to the coaches and to the, co to, to the community. And so we're making an effort to do that. And this is... The Huffines Institute is a resource for all of you. Um, we are a, a, an open institute, and in that if there's anything that we can do to help any of you in your professional pursuits, we want you to let us know. Um, we, do, we do things, actually, uh, we think we've put resources out there for all of you to use. If you go to huffinesinstitute.org, you'll find a variety of different things over the last two years that we've put in place. Um, one of the big things that we do on a weekly basis, we do audio podcasts where we interview leaders in sports medicine. Um, we talk to them about their passions, why they do what they do, what are the big things that are coming. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've done this now weekly for the last 60, I think our, this week will be number 63. Uh, we've put people up like Charlie Kimball, who is an IndyCar driver, who is the only elite race car driver that has type 1 diabetes. And uh, you can pull up his podcast and hear how he manages his diabetes at 230 miles an hour. Uh, we've put up people like Dr. Mike Sandlin, who is a mild-mannered professor. Um, some of us in the room know Mike Sandlin, and, but he is one of the world's elite ultra-marathoners. This guy runs 2,000 miles for fun. 
and talks about how he does that. We put, we've talked a lot to a guy named Dave Epstein, who's a senior writer at Sports Illustrated, who's really supporting our mission. If there's anything in Sports Illustrated over the last six years that deals with sports medicine, like all the doping stuff that goes on with Ryan Braun and with uh, Lance Armstrong and concussions, Dave is the one that has written about it. So I'd encourage you to pull those audio podcasts up. They're great resources. We have video podcasts as well up there. We have blogs. We have text articles. Uh, again, we're trying to build a resource for the community, and we encourage you to check that out. And you can subscribe. Uh, but we're not really here to talk about the Huffines Institute today. We're here to talk about our fun area of research, and I enjoy every day going to work because we never know what's going to happen when, we, when I walk in the door every day. And it's not just me. It's because all the collaborators that we have that are working in our area, what I've listed up here are our professional collaborators, and in most cases, we've published articles with these folks. Um, you can see down at the bottom, we have, I kind of have a brain trust that really kind of encourages me and, and really pushes me on some ideas. I talked about Dave Epstein. Frank Booth at Missouri and Mike Reed at Kentucky are incredibly valuable colleagues. However, the people that on a day-to-day -day basis deal with this, and I want to show you their picture because they're the ones that are responsible for a lot of the data that you're going to see today. Um, this is Kelsey Sachs, who's an undergraduate in our lab. Michelle Dawes is a genetics uh, doctoral student that we have in the lab. Um, Cheryl, I'm sorry, this is Annalisa Jimenez, which is another undergraduate. Cheryl Merrick, which is another undergraduate. This is our administrative assistant, uh, Megan Swartz. And if the most important person in a research lab is the administrative assistant, don't get me wrong. Uh, this is David Ferguson, who's one of our doctoral students, Emily Schmidt. And, well, and we don't have Samantha Springer um, uh, shown there. Now, these are all the important people that are doing all the really brilliant work that you're going to see here today. Uh, anything that I did is less than stellar most of the time. I also have to thank all of you before we jump into this because you're all taxpayers uh, of the United States and we have uh, been blessed with uh, funds from the National Institutes of Health to do a lot of what you're going to see today, so thank you for that. Hopefully by the end of the time that we're here, you won't think that your money is wasted. All right, let's jump into this. Today, we're going to cover our kind of area, and I'm going to try to make it understandable for everybody. We're, I'm going to try not to use genetic terms. We're going to talk about five different things. We're going to talk about the problem that we face. We're going to talk about how we're tackling this problem. We're going to talk about some of our results that we've had. And then I'm going to stop and tell you why we stopped doing research the way we were doing it to talk about have we taken the wrong fork. I think there's a point where the, our, our field has gone the wrong direction. Uh, we're going to talk about some potential mechanisms. I'm a physiologist. We always have to talk about mechanisms. Then some implications, and I'm going to give you some take-home messages to go away from here. So let's just pile into this. First of all, let's talk with the problem. Anytime I give this presentation, especially to a group of folks that have the knowledge that you do, I think I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, because most of you know this. Most of you know that if we do moderate physical activity and vigorous physical, act physical activity is even better, many days of the week, there's a lot of positive health outcomes. Things like a decrease in all-cause mortality rates, a decrease in cardiovascular diseases, a decrease in diabetes, decrease in several forms of cancer, decrease in stroke rates, increase in mitochondrial function, decrease in neurocognitive dysfunction, and an increase in lifespan. If there was any drug that had all of these things going for it, people would line up around the block to take it. But we know and we have a deep, rich literature that shows that moderate, regular moderate physical activity does these things. So we know this, but what's interesting is that if you look at American activity in general, you'll see that Americans in general are very physically inactive. This is data from Rich Troiano at the National Cancer Institute, and I put this up, it came out in 2008, and I put this up because it was the first large-scale study where they actually objectively measured physical activity. They put an accelerometer on a little bit over 8,000 people, and they monitored activities in these this groups. And what you can see, I've got to, the data redrawn here by age groups. We have the females on the red lines, the blue lines are the males, and the black number is the overall average. And what you can see from just looking at it is that physical activity rates are fairly low. Now, this is the y-axis here is the percentage of the adults or percentage of the individuals obtaining healthy physical activity levels. And Troiano and group defined that as doing at least 30 minutes of activity a day. Didn't have to be in all one setting, but at least 30 minutes total a day. So what you have is the percentage of folks that in each of those age groups that did at least 30 minutes a day. And I don't know about you, but when this data came out, I was stunned 
because look what happens. In most of your age groups, this uh, 20 to 59 age group, only 3.5% of the population. Now you're looking around and going, well, I'm, I'm active. The next person next to me is active. But you're, again, you guys um, are not the average American at this point. So it really is, really shows that we have a lot of inactivity going on. Actually, it's pretty scary. Even the kids, only 42% of them are moderately active on a daily basis. Now, this in the context of three other facts that I want to share with you sets our problem. First of all, we know that inactivity is the second highest actual cause of death in conjunction with poor nutrition, according to the CDC. Just to tell you how much of an actual cause of death it is, physical inactivity and poor nutrition account for more deaths per year than the next seven actual causes put together. Things like viruses and diseases and gunshots and et cetera, et cetera. Depending on which paper you look at, physical activity is responsible somewhere for between 250,000 to 400,000 deaths per year. And the economic cost to the United States is huge, huge. It's estimated that physical inactivity cost us over $500 billion a year. That's per year. It's a lot of money. I don't know about you guys, if someone gave me a billion dollars, I'd take it, wouldn't you? Yeah, we would all take it. Think, we're, we're losing $500 billion a year to, in health care just because of physical inactivity. So most Americans, though, like to think of themselves as this is the image they think of. We're rugged individuals, kind of a John Wayne type. But if you look at the data out there, I think this is probably a better indication of what a normal American is. We like the concept of exercise, but only if somebody or our pet is doing it. And we've got our drink and we're watching our TV, so we're pretty comfy cozy in that. Now, when I, was, when I came through school, I was always taught that if a person wanted to be active, they, they just wanted to be it, and they needed something like Motivation to be active. But as a scientist, I'm not quite sure that's the case. Uh, we're interested in the why. If, if we know that physical activity is good for us, and most people do if you ask them, why aren't we more active than we are? Well, as a scientist, I'm interested in the why part of this. And so we break this down. Any characteristic or phenotype is usually the result of three things. It's usually the result of, envir of environment. And when we talk about physical activity, we're talking about things like, well, let me, environment or some biological effect or the interaction between the two. Now, if we talk about environment, environment has been, at least for physical activity, has been talked about as far as culture, the built environment, si do you have sidewalks, do you have stairs that are readily accessible, safety, uh, or peer and parental support. That has been the primary focus of, of physical inactivity research. Let me give you an example of the built environment. This is a real fitness facility in California. <laughs> Look at that picture a second, something will strike you. We have an escalator to get into the fitness facility. And this is not even an ADA thing because you can't get a wheelchair on an escalator for sure. So this is an example of the built environment. And many times physiologists or folks will tell you in this field that these are the primary reasons that people are inactive or active. Well, when it comes to the genetic biological side of things, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, we've been working in this area for about now uh, 14 years. Uh, this area has certainly grown. And I think by the end of the talk, you're going to find that this is a huge issue. Um, and then we're not going to talk much about the interaction between environment and genetics because, frankly, no one knows anything about it. Uh, but there, you may have heard these terms, DNA methylation, DNA decoration. You also may have heard the term epigenetics. That's what that area is. And there is extremely uh, small amounts known there. So to give you a context or framing for what I'm about to tell you, let me show you the following. The following is our lab objective. What we strive to do on a daily basis is to determine the biological activity mechanisms of physical activity that arise from genetic factors. And put it in another way, we are concerned about the biological control of activity and not the activity effects on biology. We, don't, we do care, but we don't do research on how activity affects biology. We're concerned about, about how biology affects activity. So if you're keeping track and you know anything about statistics, we are 
you, we use the activity as our dependent variable. Okay? So that gives you some kind of con. We're interested in how biology affects activity, physical activity levels. Now, how we're tackling the problem, let me give you just a, a few minutes about how we are looking at this problem. What are the genetics of activity? When you do genetics work, you can do a, use a bunch of different models. You can use, in particular, humans, uh, which would be nice because that's what we're really interested in. Or you can use easier models like mice. And we have chosen to use mice for a variety of reasons I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, we use what are called inbred mice. And uh, we use inbred mice primarily because we are able to do things with mice that we can't do with humans. Uh, we would never get um, uh, permission to do some of these things. The mouse is actually has, is a great model of the human genome. About, I think right now the current literature says that about 79% of the genes in the mouse are the same as genes in humans. And so there's a good chance that anything we find in mice we'll be able to translate right into the humans. Um, that's what I just said. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you about inbred mice. If you are not aware of inbred mice, they are a huge, huge resource and tool in this area. What you do is you take mice and you breed them with each other for 20 generations, brother, sister mating for 20 generations. Past 20 generations, they are genomically the same. They're basically clones of each other. Okay? And so there are numerous inbred strains available. I think right now you can buy about 55 different strains easily from some of the suppliers. So you can get these animals that are essentially clones of each other and so you can do large numbers of animals and you know the genome is exactly the same. So if we use mice, how do we actually do this? Well, really simple. I'm, I'm into simple science and so we take a wheel, we mount it in a rat cage and we put a little bicycle sensor on it. Um, this is a solid surface wheel. Mice actually will run further and longer on a solid surface wheel versus a wheel that has rungs on it that you buy in the pet store. So we use a solid surface wheel. It's actually they're easier to clean as well. Uh, we then take and we put a Sigma Sport 600 bike computer. Uh, you can see the sensor on the wheel and then we hang the bike computer right outside the cage and that picks up. Um, their measurements, we measure them every 24 hours. Our standard operating procedures, we do it for 21 days starting at age nine weeks old for mice. Mice are most active between the ages of nine weeks old and 12 weeks old, and so we capture, capture that whole three week period. Every day we monitor how far they run in distance, we measure how, far, how long they've run in duration, and we can then calculate how fast they ran during that time. Uh, we measure weight on a weekly basis, and they're all under standard conditions. They're in our vivarium uh, with standard temperature and humidity, and they have standard chow, and they can drink and eat as much as they want to. So that's all we do. We just measure activity in these animals. Now, this to give you some sense of what this data looks like, this graph is a graph on, I think, 400 and, I'm sorry, 867 animals, about 43 different inbred strains of mice. What we have on the y-axis is how far they run on a daily basis. This is daily basis, and then these are the different strains. And we have both males and females in there. Now, there's a lot of different strains in here, but I want to point out a couple that we will use. The first one we're going to point out is what we call our high-active mice. They are the second from the end. These are C what are called C57LJs. And I want you to just look at how far they run on a daily basis. Draw your eye across there. They run almost 11 kilometers a day. That's, you know, over I mean, about six and a half, 6.8 miles a day. That's a 20 gram mouse that's averaging that much a day. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's a lot of distance. I think we calculated if you upscale that up to a human, you've got a human that's running about 125 miles a day every day. So it's an amazing amount of activity for, for a, a small animal. On the other end, when we talk about low active animals, we've picked the second from the end down here, the C3H HEJ. They run about a kilometer a day. So they're certainly on the low end. You may say, well, why didn't you pick the one down at the far end, the 129S1s, that look like they run about a half a kilometer a day? It's because they exhibit interesting behavior. They'll run in the wheel for a while and then they stop and they put their bed in it. So they'll put shavings in there and they'll sleep in the wheel. Don't know why, it's just that and every, strain, every one of the animals in that strain does the same thing. And so we have many stories about some of these strains. But uh, to give you some other idea, in most cases, the females are more active than the males. 
Uh, and that's not an observation. We've only seen, other people have seen that as well. And um, it's, this is very repeatable in these animals. Day-to-day -day correlations are very high between 0 0.74 and 0.85. So it's very high correlation. They run, if they run, they run the same amount on a day-to-day -day basis, which makes it a very powerful model. Okay, a good question before we move on to this, from this, is does a mouse running in a wheel, is that a good model of humans' voluntary activity? And the answer, I think, is yes, for several reasons. First of all, if you look at the, uh, some sim there are similar responses between humans and mice in cardiovascular functioning during physical activity. If you look at some of their enzyme activities in both muscle and mitochondria, you see the same thing, very similar things. More importantly, you see the same changes in brain neurotransmitters, in particular BDNF and a few others. Um, if you, especially if you compare it against mice on a treadmill. If you take and put mice on a treadmill and you force them to run, you see a lot of different responses than what you see with humans when they do voluntary activity. It's one of the reasons that we stop doing treadmill work and we do all running wheel work as well. But for me, the most important point was that if you take humans and you put, if you tell a human to get, put themselves on a treadmill and exercise, and you put a mouse and you let them exercise, both species will self-select about 70% of max intensity to exercise at. So again, you tell, you tell the human, get on the treadmill and just exercise. They'll exercise at about 70% of their, their max. You do the same thing with the mouse, and they exercise at about 70% of their max as well. So they choose self-select very similar levels. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, if we're looking at how to do this, how to figure out if there's a genetic issue here, uh, we, we can't, we'll use an approach, the traditional approach was outlined by one of our colleagues, Kleberger, Steve Kleberger, several years ago, but in this rare case, it's easier for me to tell you in words what he shows in pictures. First of all, we're going to answer four questions. Is there a genetic influence? Secondly, where are the genetic factors located in the genome? What are the identity of those genetic factors? And fourthly, what are the mechanisms? Okay, that, we're gonna, that's, the, that's the process we're going to walk through. I'm going to answer those four questions for you. So let me show you some of the results that we've got so far. Our, so our first question, is there a genetic influence on physical activity? Or put another way, can you be born a couch potato? And let me ask you up front, what's the opposite of a couch potato in the vegetable world? Yeah, we were stumped too when we tried to think of that. Yeah, we, we've used the term frantic banana. That's what has come up with us. So, you, can you be born a couch potato? Can you be born a frantic banana? Well, I'm going to tell you right up front, I have the assertion on this next slide. There is genetic control of activity, and I base that on these, I think, 15 studies. Uh, every study that has looked at this question in the literature has come back with a resounding yes. And let me, I'm not going to walk you through all these studies, but let me show you the general format. These are the authors over here. This is the, the model that they used, either human or mouse. That's the only thing that's been done out there. Human or mouse. This is the year. And this number, this is H squared or G squared. That's the amount of, uh, that's the, the total percentage of activity that's controlled by genetics. Okay? That's the percentage of total activity that's controlled by genetics. So in this case, for Caprio study, the amount of activity that was controlled by genetics was 62%. Okay? This out here in the parentheses where it was measured, that's the environmental control. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But let me point out a couple of these studies, first of all, before we go on. First of all, Juicen's study is probably the best human study out there because they're the only one to objectively measure physical activity. They actually put accelerometers on their people. They measured it so we know exactly how active those individuals were. All the other human studies use surveys, which are problematic. What's interesting about the Juicen study is that they also have the highest heritability. That study shows that 92% of the activity of those, of those subjects was controlled by genetics. Amazing amount. Um, this is Janine Stubbs paper. It came out in 2006. What's fascinating about this, this is one of the largest human studies done. They measured, they looked at 87,000 people. 87,000, I'll repeat that a couple times. Can you imagine 80, that's a football stadium full of people, and that was actually twins. So they looked at a little bit over 42,000 pairs of twins in this. You can see they also showed high um, correlations with, with heritability. 
Uh, Stubb also did another study about the same time it came out in humans that from our own lab Mike Turner did uh, in mice. I think they were published a month apart. We had no clue they were doing it. But what this shows was that the amount of, act the amount of activity that's controlled by genetics changes with aging and almost the same amount from 41% to 76%. They show theirs went up to 85%. And uh, I've underlined, to come back to, this is the environmental effect. We talked about sidewalks and safety and culture and all that other. I want you to look at that number. Again, that's the percentage, that the, those numbers that are underlined, that's the percentage of activity that's controlled by common environmental factors. And if you'll notice that number, I think the highest one is 9%. 12%. Very little, in most cases it's zero. Very little common environmental effect on the amount of activity done. If there's another number, that's a unique environment effect and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, this is what many people in the field go. When I talk about this, me, I had many colleagues, especially health education colleagues, who said, that, no way that's correct. And all you do is say, here's the literature. Tell me why it's wrong. Genetics is the primary controller of physical activity. So. Is physical activity genetically controlled? The answer is absolutely yes, no doubt. So where are these factors located? To find out where they're located in the genome, we wind up building maps, okay, genomic maps. And genomic maps allow us to do the following. They help us to narrow down the genomic location so maybe we can find the genes, okay? That's like saying that there's a group of about 200 people sitting listening to a genetics lecture at UT Arlington and if we can narrow down where that's at in Texas, we have a better sense of where it's at. But the problem with that is the problem with this map up here. What's the problem with this map? I'm sorry? Uh, well, it's, it's Texas, but what, it doesn't have the right cities on it, doesn't it? We don't know. There's no, Arlington's not on it. The two most important cities in Texas are not on this map. <laughs> right? So it's important when we do genomic maps is we make good maps. There's a couple of ways we can do this, and I'm just going to blow through this right quick. This actually took us about five years to do, six years, and it's going to take me about two minutes to describe. Uh, a couple different ways you can do it. You can, we can breed ma mice to do it. We can take a high active mouse and a low active mouse. We breed them out to the grandchildren, and then we can do a lot of molecular biology. And when you do that, the problem with it's only specific to those two strains of mice. We can't generalize this to humans in particular. Another way we can get at this is we can do what's called uh, genome-wide association studies or GWASs. The problem with GWASs though is you need uh, thousands of subjects and uh, disadvantages, uh, you need large cohorts of, of, of subjects, but you may miss the small areas that have some influence. So having said that, this is the current map, genomic map, that associates parts of the genome with physical activity. Um, we have actually taken, there are three human studies that have looked at this, and we've taken the human data and we've put it onto the mouse chromosome, uh, the mouse genome, just because there are, there are more mouse uh, studies at this point. Now, what each of these show is if we, let's, let's pick this one here on 17, something, and I, I emphasize something, on chromosome 17 is associated with exercise participation. That, was, that came from one of the human studies. So each time you see one of these areas, that means something in those areas are associated with some form of physical activity. That's the current map right now. So the idea here is, is that if we want to find the genes that are responsible for activity, we can lo go look in some of those areas, look and see what genes there are, and hopefully that will give us what genes are involved with regulating physical activity. So, is, there, is daily physical activity genetically controlled? Yes. Where are the genetic factors? We've got good maps. This map actually explains somewhere between 89% to 100% of the genetic influence. So this is a really good map. Okay, it's got all the right cities on it, in other words. Okay? So our next question is, what are the genes that are involved? Or what are the genetic factors that are involved? Now I can tell you when we started on this 14 years ago, I figured that by now, Someone would be standing in front of you, whether it be me or somebody else, and would have a slide that said something like this, that looked like this, and would say something like, we've narrowed the gene that controls activity down to one of the following two. Okay, that's supposed to be a joke, by the way. Okay, it's not really a joke if you have to ask for the laughter, right? 
But there's some problems with that approach. The, the traditional approach is what we've been following. The traditional approach in genetics is that uh, you make a good genomic map, and so this is the chromosome, and you may have an area that you have picked out. You look in that area and you find a gene that you think may be involved with physical activity or have functional relevance. Something like actinin and 2, which has been talked about a lot in the literature. And so we, we, in one of our areas, actinin and 2 is in there, and we thought, oh man, this is really cool. So then what you do is you take and you design some tests, and you test each of these potential genes. And what we normally look for is we determine, see if there's at least four independent lines to suggest that that candidate gene is really involved with activity or if it's just a good guess. The problem with this approach, which many people have figured out over the last six years, including us, is that when you start looking at these areas, these QTLs, you see a lot of genes that may be involved with physical activity. In our case, we saw things like myostatin, DRD2, dopamine receptor 2, calcisequestrin, um, um, FST, a lot of zinc finger proteins. These all could be involved with physical activity. The problem is we don't have time to test all of them. And so what's interesting is when you look at the literature, the literature suggests that this approach has less than a 1% chance of finding the genes that are involved. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means, but what that means is that the traditional approach that's been used for the last 30 years in genetics to try to figure out the genetics of anything doesn't work, is broken, doesn't work. And so this really started to become appreciated by us uh, a couple years ago. However, we've trundled on. Uh, this is a table. I will show you this just to say that I've shown you some possible genes. This is a table that came out of a chapter that we wrote, and it basically lists all the genes right now that are being considered to be part of physical act or being uh, controlling physical activity. And uh, well, I'm not going to worry about all this stuff out here, but here's the gene names, and we've got good candidate genes, the ones that have at least four, three or four lines of, of evidence. We've got some potential candidate genes, and then we've got some genes down here that have been suggested that don't have a lot of evidence for them. Okay, I'm not going to go through any of these just because they're interesting, but at this point, as a scientist, I would tell you there's no hard data to support any of them except the top two right now. Okay? So we're going to tell you how we're going to get around that in a second. So about this time when we started saying, you know, there's a problem with this. How am I doing on time, Barry? I'm good? 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes. Oh, I can do that. Okay. So about the time we started dealing with this, <clears throat> found out that the classical approach didn't work very well, we started thinking, have we done something? Have we gone down the wrong pathway? And let me show you two pieces of data, and I'll explain what it means, because in and of themselves, you go, what? That's what we did when we first saw it. This is a study that came from uh, Kelly, who works in, uh, Scott Kelly, who works in Daniel Palm's lab in North Carolina, at North Carolina. He's one of our colleagues. And what they have shown here, we've got a, our, our genomic map here, and what they have shown, when they measure activity over six days, what they have shown is that the areas of the genome that are responsible for activity move on a daily basis. Let me show you what this is like. Let me put this in motion here. So they started off and they said, we've got four areas in the genome that are responsible for activity.